Spen Thorpe here with Farm Equipment Magazine, back with another episode of our Thought Leaders series. Today, we are here with Eric Raby from Kloss. Eric, can you give us just a quick intro on who you are and what you do? Sure. Thanks for having me, uh, Ben. Really appreciate it. Uh, I look after all of the uh, commercial business uh, for Kloss in North and South America. So that's uh, parts, service, sales, distribution development, um, academy training, um, all those different things, marketing, product development. So uh, uh, keeps me keeps me quite busy between uh, up here in the U.S. and Canada and uh, down south in South America, too. So I can imagine. OK, great. Um, and what we're here to talk about today is something that I didn't know about until just a couple of days ago, but your start in the industry as a technician. So can you kind of just walk us through the story about how you came into that position? Sure, sure. And I tell a lot of people, they ask me about my history in the farm equipment business. And I said, well, I did start out as a technician, but I wasn't very good at it. Uh, so then they put me in sales and it turned out I wasn't very good at that either. So now I'm in management. Uh, but uh, at any at any rate, no, back to back to that. So when I was in high school, um, uh, our, one of our FFA um, programs was kind of a co-op program. So uh, for a couple of summers, I would work uh, at a dealership in my hometown, Russellville, Kentucky. Uh, it was called Russellville Tractor Company. Uh, we were a Ford tractor dealer. We had New Holland. Uh, we had Alice Chalmer, then Deutsch Alice, and we also had Kubota and then a lot of other short lines. We had a, a, a very wide array of product. Um, and basically what I was um, tasked to do was less on the technician side to start with. And it was more on I did a lot of setup and pre-delivery. Uh, we were just getting into the Kubota business and um, had a lot of compact tractors that all came in crates. So my job was to uh, to disassemble uh, the crates and then assemble the tractors. And I got pretty crafty at it because they were all in wooden crates and it was just really hard using a crowbar to, to pull them apart. So I went and bought an electric chainsaw and uh, I was uh, in the shop there and I, you could tell when I was getting ready to put a new tractor together because that really loud, obnoxious electric chainsaw would be buzzing around as I cut the crate in two. Uh, but um, yeah, it, it was uh, it was a really good experience for me in terms of um, understanding not only the technical side of the business from a, from an early age, uh, but it also gave me the opportunity to go out and, and be in the field when I was doing a pre-delivery or a setup or something like that of a, of a piece of machinery. And actually, when um, when I finished high school and I went to uh, university, I uh, actually enrolled um, in a program that was called, um, it's an ag tech program. It's a two-year degree, but you could continue on and get your four-year degree. So for my first two years at university, most everything that I did was was technical um in nature so we had hydraulics classes we had elect, um, electrical class uh, diesel uh, systems class just lots of different things um, that that really kind of supported that technical aspect of the business so i think you know it really allowed me to look at it more than just from the relationship of hey someone somewhere is going to build a piece of equipment i'm going to go sell it it really gave me an understanding of um, the technical aspect of the machine, but also how very, very important what happens after delivery of a machine is to, you know, to the overall experience of the customer. Mm -hmm. And um, so what what was kind of your pathway after after that? I know you've you've been in the industry a long time. Can you kind of just give us an overview of you started at the dealership and where'd you kind of go from there? Well, when I went to university, um, Western Kentucky University, and I was working on my degree there, I actually went to work for another dealership uh, in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Uh, it was a Ford New Holland. We had Ford when it was Ford. We had New Holland and we also had Versatile uh, and a lot of other short lines as well. Um, but I was in sales there. Um, so um, I actually went to school full time and I actually worked full time as well. Um, so I got to I had to massage my classes very carefully, but I, it ended up working out. But that was, I think, really fundamental for me in keeping me engaged in the industry. So I've seen the technical aspect of it. Now it was more into the sales aspect of it. Uh, and it was really a uh, really good experience for me uh, to see, you know, the interaction of customers, um, both on the service side and on the sales side. What are the things that you need to be paying attention to? Uh, and really, you know, what are customers looking for? And I think one of the things that it really taught me early on is how important it is to listen um, versus talking. 
And I think, um, you know, I, I learned a few lessons the hard way by talking too much. But uh, if you're paying attention, uh, you, you do learn from those things. And then after that, um, I went to work um, after I graduated from university. Uh, I went to work for Heston. Uh, it was still owned at Fiat by the time. And uh, I went back into service and I was a field service representative uh, and I was teaching service training um, whenever we would have a, a, a warranty campaign or something like that. I was uh, my job was to go around to the dealers and make sure that those things were getting done, that they had the parts they needed to do those. So I, I went back into the service aspect again. And then when Agco purchased Heston, um, I just became a region service manager, but still in service, just covering more products then. Um, so, and then after that, I went back to sales again um, for a few years, uh, and then I went into wholesale, um, basically looking after the um, Northeast United States. So I had from Maine down to West Virginia, um, and so dealers would call in and say, "I need to find this piece of equipment, or I need to order this kit for my planter, or you know, uh, my freight rates are too high." Those type things, as it dealt with whole goods. So was yet another um, opportunity for, for me to understand, you know, mating up production of a machine and then ultimately delivery to the dealer and everything that has to happen in there. So that was that was a good experience. And then after that, um, I did that in Kansas City for a while and then moved to Atlanta. And then after that, I moved to uh, Iowa and I was a region sales manager for Iowa and Illinois. Uh, and then after that, there was a reshuffle and I lost Illinois, I kept Iowa, I picked up Wisconsin, Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota. So I moved from Iowa to Minnesota, to Minneapolis, and covered that area for a while. And then I went back to Atlanta and was a product manager for seating and tillage. And uh, it was Farmhand, Glencoe, and Ty, uh, which are brands that uh, a lot of people will remember. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of those brands aren't around anymore, uh, but I did that and then, um, was able to then uh, go in to be the uh, general marketing manager for Heston. Uh, and I had that job for a while. And then I went to, uh, uh, became head of, uh, it was funny, I was uh, made uh, VP of sales for North America. And um, one day I'd been in the job probably about three weeks or something like that. And Bob Ratliff uh, called me into his office and said, hey, how's the new job going? I said, oh, it's going great. I really enjoy it. And Glad to be back in sales and, and working with people I know. And he said, well, hey, I've got a new job for you. And it was to be <laughs> in charge of Massey Ferguson um, for North America. Uh, and that was really on the marketing side and, and the, the product side of things. And then after that, I moved to the UK. I uh, was in charge of uh, Challenger um, and the Ag Kim brands, which were separate at that time for Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. Uh, did that for a year. And then I moved to Switzerland. Uh, for almost three years, and I was in charge of all the brands for Eastern Europe and Asia. Um, and then I came back to Atlanta again and was in charge of global marketing uh, for all the ACO brands um, globally. Um, and then uh, one day my phone rang and it was someone from Kloss and said, hey, have you ever thought about uh, maybe doing something a little bit different? And I'm like, well, Maybe. It's not like I'm uh, not able to move. I think I've demonstrated my ability to, to move. I would say, yeah. So uh, I had some discussions with Kloss. Uh, actually, part of the interview, I met with Katrina Kloss in Frankfurt. And then I took a train to Harsavinkel and met with Helmut Kloss and interviewed with him. And uh, they offered me the job. And uh, the rest, uh, they say, is history. And I've been with, uh, it seems like it was just yesterday, but I've been with Kloss almost eight years now. Wow. All right. You, I was going to make a comment about how much you moved and how many different positions you had. So you really have seen from the, from the bottom all the way to where you are now. Um, yeah. It's, it, it been, yeah, no, I, it, it, it's been, I feel myself to be very fortunate to have had the opportunities, not only to experience different companies and different geographies around the world, but to really understand what goes in at the different levels in the dealership, uh, having done those, you know, stances um, as a technician and also as a salesperson, it really gives you an understanding and I think of an appreciation uh, for what our, our dealers um, and their personnel are going through. So I, I value that very, very much. Mm -hmm. How would you say the needs 
of technicians and service departments have changed from when you were there to, to now? Oh, well, needs is, and, and that's a really good word that you use because our biggest need right now is just to have more technicians. Um, you know, it was, um, and I would say when, when I was a technician, things were still very manual and, you know, it was a, you were, you were combating a hydraulic problem and not a software update or something like that. Um, still requires some technical expertise, but I think today's technicians um, have not only have, have to have an understanding of those basic systems that are contained in all of our farm equipment, but they also have to have an acumen for technology, um, whether it's um, diagnosing an air code or at the very least helping a farmer who got into their combine for the first time since last year and needs to know how to set up his auto guidance, um, those type things. So it really takes, I would say, an individual that the caliber of today's technician, and there's no offense to people who used to be technicians, but the caliber of today's technician is at a very high level uh, just because of, I would say, the advances that we've made in the industry in terms of technology. But I think one of the other things that can't ever be um, stated enough, too, is their empathy, if you will, because a lot of times, and I found this to be true in my experience and also find it to be true when I talk to technicians is that farmers will tell them things and they'll share things with them that they won't share with anyone else in the dealership. There's, there's, there's a trust level there. And I think we need to be aware of that. Don't ever undermine that, but understand that our technicians um, are, are really held in high regard, not only in the dealerships, but even higher regard in terms of what the customer thinks of uh, their relationship and their dependence on them. Hmm. Yeah, and that was going to be my next question is, um, and that's a great example of something, but how would you say that your time in the dealerships now impact how you work with your dealerships? Is there a deeper understanding and a kind of benefit from that? Yeah, and I mean, they're obviously confronting a lot of problems that we didn't have to deal with when I was in the dealership, but, um, um, and, and, you know, I still do travel around to dealers a lot, and, and it's more about understanding. I always like to go and show me your parts department, show me your, your service department, let me meet some people and, and understand what are the big challenges that you're facing today um, or are there opportunities too? Um, you know, uh, I'll, I'm one of the er few areas that I don't have a lot of experience in is parts. So I'm interested to learn more about that and thank goodness we have some really good parts people in, in class today so they can tell me, but, you know, understanding um, what does it mean, you know, I'll give you one example. We get requests all the time for daily stock orders. And my question is, is, OK, what is the reason that you want to have a daily stock order? Well, I know the answer. It's free freight. So the, the and that's a, a way <laughs> that's a way for them to get free freight, but have a, a fairly continuous supply of parts. So and that becomes a little problematic for us on the the manufacturer side and all of our you know our parts people are like oh we can't do that we can't do that and i'm like well put your put yourself in the shoes of the dealer for a moment and you know what are the pros and cons of us having it or not having it for him what are the pros and cons for having it or not having it for us and can we find something that might you know be be workable for for both so i i tend to and a lot of times that our, our people will will say well you you're only looking at it or, or you, you, you're siding with the dealer more times than not. I'm like, well, at the end of the day, that's how we that's how we market our products. And we need to make sure that, you know, to me, it's not a win lose. It either needs to be a win win or a lose lose. But we need to be um, in partnership with our dealers and, and they need to hold us accountable in the same way that we hold them accountable. And I think having been on that other side in the dealership has allowed me to at least at one point in my career, had that viewpoint from the other side, the dealer looking outward. Pivoting now to, I mean, we've already touched on it, the technician shortage. Um, we hear a lot about the different things that dealers do to bring in technicians and retain them. There's the marketing of the open positions. There's working with universities. Um, what are maybe some of the more innovative ex examples you've seen of, of some of your dealers bringing in and retaining technicians? Or what do you think dealers need to be doing that maybe they're not? Yeah, I think one of the things that we have seen, and not just from Kloss, but across our industry, is partnering with technical schools, uh, whether it's at the company level or the dealership level, and really 
making available, I'll call it scholarships for people that want to go through the technical training, uh, maybe helping them with the uh, tool purchases, uh, those type things. One of the things that we've done is we have a um, apprenticeship program. It's based here in Omaha where we actually have classrooms uh, and a lab set up in our facility here. And it serves uh, three purposes, really. It, uh, we provide training for people who want to work in production. We provide training for people who might want to work in our dealership. For instance, we have five locations here in Nebraska uh, for technical training. But it also provides training opportunities for people who want to work on the whole goods side or the OEM side. Um, and it's, it's, it's partnered with the uh, Metro Community College here in Omaha. So they're enrolled in Metro Community College and they go half the time to those classes and the other half of the time they'll come here for, for practical study. And, um, and I would invite you next time you're here, I could show it to you, but it's really, it's brand new. We opened it up during COVID as part of our new academy, um, but it's a really dynamic program, two-year program. I think we've just had our first group of graduates come out of that. And uh, so that helps. The, the problem with that is, is getting it scaled because we can't in one location, you know, graduating a handful of people every year, keep up with demand that we have or the demand that our dealers have. So I think we as an industry need to keep looking for, for better ways to, to engage with colleges and universities. And I think the other one, too, is engaging kids at a younger age um, and, and really trying to show them, and, and not just from a technician standpoint, but really plumbers, electricians, all the skilled trades, those things, we really need to, to show kids at a young age that not only is that acceptable, it's desirable. I don't know if you've you know hired a plumber or an electrician lately, but they're not cheap. Um, so I think there's, it, it's, it's, it takes a, a, an effort from everyone. That's the the, the bad news is, is that we've got um, a lot of ground to make up. The good news is everyone knows about it and we're aware of it. So uh, I think it's going to continue to be at the forefront of our dealers for sure. And, and also us as, as manufacturers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we've covered some good ground today. Any wrap up thoughts on, on your time as a technician and with dealers and how it's helping you today? I think we didn't cover. No, I yeah, it's um, no, it was uh, probably one of the, you know, the, the greatest time. I mean, I was young. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. But uh, at the end of the day, it was uh, I, I know I, I know I learned more now from it than I gave myself credit for then. Uh, and it was a great experience. And, and I would encourage, you know, and that's one of the things, too, is when we talk to young people and say, hey, um, you can do anything you want to. But the more opportunities that you can expose yourself to. Uh, the better off you'll be uh, in the end because every experience is, is another page in your book of life and uh, you can always go back and reference it. Well said. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Eric. This has been great. Right. And uh, hopefully we'll talk again soon. Sounds good, man. Thank you, sir.